Chapter 1 A Violent Crime Billy Ray Cobb sat on the back of the pickup drinking a beer, watching his friend Pete Willard take his turn with the black girl. She was ten and small for her age. She did not look at the men on top of her. He was breathing hard and swearing. He was hurting her. When he finished, he hit her in the mouth and laughed. And the other man laughed, too. Then they laughed harder and rolled around the grass by the pickup, screaming like two crazy men. The girl lay in a pool of blood and beer. Later, Willard asked what Billy Ray planned to do now that they had finished with her. Billy Ray said they should kill her. Are you going to do it? asked Willard. Cobb hesitated. No, nah, I'll let you do it. Willard said, It wasn't my idea. You're the one who's good at killing niggers. You do it. He thought for a minute while he finished a beer. Let's throw her off a bridge. Good idea. Very good idea, said Billy Ray. They drove past Lake Chatulla, a large man-made mud hole in the far southwest corner of Ford County, looking for a place to throw out their unwanted passenger. At each bridge they approached, they saw blacks fishing in the muddy water. Cobb was getting desperate by now. He turned off into a side road, and stopped the pickup. They threw her into the long grass at the edge of the woods. Carl Lee Haley did not hurry home when he got the phone call. Gwen was easily excited, and she had called him at work before, when she thought the children had been kidnapped. He only became anxious when he turned into his yard and saw the police car parked next to the house. As he opened the front door, he wondered where Tony and the boys were. Then he heard Gwen crying. To his right, in the small living room, he saw a crowd around a small figure. The child was covered with towels and surrounded by crying relatives. As he went closer, the crying stopped and they moved back. Carl Lee Haley asked what had happened. No one answered. Only Gwen stayed by the girl, holding her hand. He knelt beside the sofa and touched the girl's shoulder. He spoke to his daughter, and she tried to smile. Both her eyes were swollen shut and bleeding. Carl Lee stood and turned to the crowd and demanded to know what had happened. He asked for the third time. The deputy, Willie Hastings, one of Gwen's cousins, stepped forward and told Carl Lee that some people were fishing down by the river when they saw Tanya lying in the middle of the road. She told them her daddy's name, and they brought her home. What happened, Willie? Carl Lee shouted as he stared at the deputy. Hastings spoke slowly, looking out of the window, while he repeated what Tanya had told her mother about the white men and their pickup and the rope and the trees and being hurt when they got on her. Hastings stopped when he heard the sound of the approaching ambulance. Carl Lee walked out of the house with his daughter in his arms. He whispered gently to her the tears rolling down his face. He walked to the back of the ambulance and stepped inside. The doctor closed the door and carefully took her from him. Ozzie Walls was the only black sheriff in Mississippi. He was proud of this, especially since Ford County was 74% white and the other black sheriffs had been from much blacker counties. He arrested Billy Ray Cobb and Willard and Hueys, 
a bar on Highway 365 near the lake outside town. They had been there all evening, drinking whiskey and telling everybody about the good time they had been having. Bad news travels fast, and the story had soon reached the sheriff. Ozzie was smiling when he walked to the table where Cobb was sitting with Willard and two others. I'm sorry, sir, but we don't allow niggers in here, said Cobb, and the four started to laugh. Ozzie continued to smile. When the laughing stopped, Ozzie said, You boys having a good time, Billy Ray? We were. Looks like it. I hate to interrupt your conversation, but you and Mr. Willard need to come with me. Where are we going? Willard asked. For a ride. I ain't moving, said Cobb. Willard stared desperately at Cobb. Cobb drank his beer and said, I ain't going to jail. Ozzie's deputy passed the sheriff the longest, blackest police stick ever used in Ford County. Ozzie struck the center of the table, sending beer and cans in all directions. Willard sat up as if he had been hit. He put his wrists together and held them out for Deputy Looney. He was dragged outside and thrown into a police car. Cobb did not move. Ozzy took him by the hair and lifted him from his chair, then pushed his face into the floor. He put a knee into his back, slid his stick under his throat, and pulled upward while pushing down on the knee. Cobb stopped moving when he couldn't breathe anymore. He was no trouble after that. Ozzy dragged Cobb by the hair across the dance floor, out of the door, across the yard, and threw him into the back seat with Willard. Jake Briggins woke at 5.30 a.m. as usual, rolled out of bed, and went downstairs to make coffee for his wife Carla. She was still asleep. He had to be at the coffee shop at 6 a.m. He had made many rules like this for himself. He was ambitious, but poor. If he was going to be the most successful lawyer in the state, he knew he would also have to be the hardest working. He gave Carla her coffee, kissed his still-sleeping four-year-old daughter goodbye, and went out of the house. The new red Saab he drove had a lot in common with the beautiful 19th-century house he had just left. First, they were the only ones of their kind in Ford County. Second, he owed the three local banks a lot of money for both of them. There were good reasons why Jake Briggins worked so hard. He heard about the rape of Tanya Haley at the coffee shop as he was eating breakfast with Tim Nunley, who worked at the local garage, and Bill and Bert West, who worked at the shoe factory north of town. There were three deputies having breakfast at the next table, and they asked him if he had defended Billy Ray Cobb on a drugs case a few years ago. No, I didn't represent him. I think he had a Memphis lawyer, Jake replied. What's he done? We arrested him last night for rape. Rape? Yes, him and Pete Willard. Who did they rape? You remember that Haley nigger you looked after in that murder trial a few years ago? Lester Haley? Of course I remember. You know his brother Carl Lee? Sure, know him well. I know all the Haleys, represented most of them. Well, it was his little girl. You're joking. No. Suddenly... Jake didn't feel hungry anymore. He pushed his plate to one side. He listened to the conversation change from fishing to Japanese cars and back to fishing. At three minutes before seven, 
Jake unlocked the front door to his office and turned on the lights. His office was a two-story building in a row of two-story buildings overlooking the courthouse on the north side of the square, just down from the coffee shop. The building had been built by the Wilbanks family back in the 1890s, when they owned most of Ford County. There had been a Wilbanks practicing law in the building until 1979, when Jake's employer, Lucian Wilbanks, had been thrown out of the legal profession for a series of offenses resulting from a serious drink problem. Lucian had been more hurt by this than anything that had happened to him in his troubled life. He gave the keys of the office to Jake and left town. The firm was now Jake's, and though Lucian had come back, he had no involvement with it. He spent most of his time up at the Wilbanks place, drinking whiskey and looking out over the garden. Carl Lee had not been able to sleep at the hospital. Tanya's condition was serious, but she was not going to die. They had seen her at midnight, after the doctor warned them that she looked bad. She did. Gwen had kissed the little bandaged face, while Carl Lee stood at the end of the bed, unable to do anything but stare at the small figure surrounded by machines, tubes, and nurses. The sheriff, Ozzie Walls, brought coffee and cakes at two in the morning and told Carl Lee all he knew about Cobb and Willard. Jake began to check his mail. He heard his secretary, Ethel Twitty, come in at 8.30, as usual. At around that time, Sheriff Ozzie Walls was typing up Pete Willard's story of the rape. Ozzie had told Willard what had happened to the last white man who had gone to the state jail at Parchman. About five years ago, a young white man in Helena County raped a black girl. She was twelve. They were waiting for him when he got to Parchman. Knew he was coming. On his first night, about thirty blacks tied him over a big oil drum and climbed on. The guards watched and laughed. They hate rapists. The other prisoners got him every night for three months. And then they killed him. After that, Willard seemed to want to help the sheriff as much as he could. Chapter 2 Revenge Jake was in court the next day to see Billy Ray and Willard go before the local judge and to hear Ozzie Wall's report of Willard's story. Carl Lee was there, too. As soon as they had heard the judge say that the two men should be kept in jail, Carl Lee and Jake walked out of the courtroom and down to the first floor. They stopped at the back door of the court. They talked about Tanya and Carl Lee's family. Then Carl Lee told Jake that his younger brother Lester was coming down from Chicago. What's Lester coming in for? Jake asked. Family business. Are you two planning something? No, he just wants to see Tanya. You two be careful. That's easy for you to say, Jake. I know. You've got a little girl. If she was lying up in the hospital, beaten and raped, what would you do? Jake looked through the window of the door and could not answer. Carl Lee waited. Don't do anything stupid, Carl Lee. Answer my question. What would you do? I don't know. I don't know what I'd do. Let me ask you this. If it was your little girl, and if it was two niggers, and you could get your hands on them, what would you do? Kill them? Carl Lee smiled, then laughed. 
I'm sure you would, Jake. I'm sure you would. Then you'd hire an expensive lawyer to say you were crazy, just like you did when you defended Lester. As they came out of the courthouse, Jake told Carl Lee it had been different when Lester was on trial. There was no planning. The man Lester had killed had attacked him first. Carl Lee looked back up at the stairs. Is this how they'll come into the courtroom? He asked, without looking at Jake. Who? Those boys. Yes. Most of the time they take them up those stairs. It's quicker and safer. They can park right outside the door here. Are you ready to defend another member of my family? Don't do it, Carl Lee. It's not worth it. What if you're found guilty and they give you the electric chair? What about your children? Who'll look after them? I have no choice, Jake. I'll never sleep till those two are dead. I owe it to my little girl. I owe it to myself. And I owe it to my people. It'll be done. They opened the doors and walked down to Washington Street, opposite Jake's office. They shook hands. Jake promised to stop at the hospital the next day to see Gwen and the family. One more thing, Jake. Will you meet me at the jail when they arrest me? Jake nodded before he thought about what Carl Lee was saying. Carl Lee smiled and walked down the sidewalk to his pickup. Carl Lee's younger brother, Lester, drove from Chicago to Clanton in his new Cadillac. It was late Wednesday night when he arrived at the hospital. He found some of his cousins reading magazines in the second-floor waiting room. When he saw Carl Lee, he pulled him close and held him tightly. They had not seen each other since the Christmas holidays, when half the blacks in Chicago traveled home to Mississippi and Alabama. How is she? Lester asked. Better. Much better. Might go home this weekend. Lester felt his breathing get easier. When he had left Chicago eleven hours earlier, he had thought she was near death. He lit a cigarette under the no-smoking sign and stared at his big brother. You okay? Carl Lee nodded. He looked down the hall. Come outside, he said. I've got some things to ask you. The Ford County Courthouse opened at 8 a.m. and closed at 5 p.m. every day, except Friday, when it closed at 4.30. At 4.30 on Friday, Carl Lee was hiding in a first-floor toilet. He sat and listened quietly for an hour. No one. Silence. He walked through the wide, dark hall to the back doors and looked through the window. There was no one around. He listened for a while. No one. He started to study the building. He pretended to be on trial. He put his hands behind him and walked the thirty feet to the stairs. Up the stairs, ten steps, then a turn to the left, just like Lester said. He had a good memory, and Lester's time in the army had made him good at giving directions. Carl Lee studied the courthouse for over an hour. Up and down, up and down, he followed the movements that would be made by the men who had raped his daughter. He followed them in his mind, room by room. He sat in the judge's chair and looked out over the court. He sat in one of the comfortable chairs in the jury box. He sat in the witness chair. It was dark at seven o'clock when Carl Lee Haley raised a window in the toilet and went quietly through the bushes and into the darkness. Getting the gun was no problem. 
Carl Lee and Lester just went to Memphis, met an old army friend, 